My name is Elizabeth Moylan. I'm publisher for Research Integrity and Publishing Ethics at Wiley. And today I'm going to share a presentation which was shared previously as part of a series of open research workshops in 2020 to several UK universities in partnership with the UK Reproducibility Network, and that's on authorship and the importance of authorship. So I'll be talking about why authorship really matters, um, some tips and tricks to think about early and agree your approach with your co-authors and some tools to describe um, contributions and to identify all your work across borders and time. So why does authorship matter? Well, it gives recognition and credit for the work done, accountability for reported research, it confers moral and legal rights, especially copyright, Careers. And while there's no um, sole definition of what merits authorship, I've included a link here to the authorship criteria from the ICMJE, uh, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, who recommend that authors play a substantial role in a piece of research, uh, contribute to the drafting or writing or final approval of the research, um, approve the final version for submission, and also agree to be accountable for all aspects of the research. So what are the challenges that people face? Well, um, there's certainly different um, discipline specific approaches taken with respect to authorship. It's very different, for example, in, in the humanities as opposed to the biomedical sciences. We see cultural specific approaches. There can be challenges um, where there are many authors on a paper. Um, this is an example of a physics paper which set the record with more than 5,000 authors on a paper. And then in between collaborations across disciplines can be tricky as well in determining uh, authorship and significant contributions. Who should be an author? Who should be acknowledged? And of all the research integrity and publication ethics issues brought to cope, um, authorship issues are a common concern. This is Sharon Pearson. She was COPE secretary for a while at COPE. And um, she took a deep dive into the authorship cases that COPE um, had seen on their uh, publicly available uh, cases database. And she could see that um, a range of issues kept cropping up and they're on this slide here of which questionable changes to author lists after submission was a common concern. And based on the uh, resulting analysis, COPE have written a discussion document on authorship, and it's a, a really helpful resource um, for authors as well as editors. So I've included a link on this slide. So what are the solutions then? Well, it's all about forging responsible authorship, and I think uh, paramount to this is to discuss and establish agreement among all of authors early on in the process. Who should be included? Who will be a corresponding author? Who will be acknowledged? It's really important when you set out on a piece of research to have those conversations early, not at the point of writing up the paper. And as per a meeting, keep a record of your agreements because contributions may change during the research and writing process and other people may become involved. So frequent communication is key. And um, I think as well, adopting standards that promote transparency, such as credit and ORCID, I'm going to talk about that in the next slides, are helpful as well. So um, many of you may be familiar with author contribution statements, which are quite common now in journal articles, which facilitate transparent disclosure of which author did what on a paper. And that moves us away from this situation on the left hand side, which is a cartoon situation, but it might resonate with some of you where the author order on the paper is. We can't really know who did what. Um, so we've gone from a situation where um, perhaps the first author was a senior grad student um, they made the figures, um, their first author, but the third author, you know, really did uh, a lot of the experiments and performed the analysis, wrote the whole paper, but thinks being third author is fair. So we're moving from this situation on the left to a situation on the right where we can clearly see who co contributed what. So that's a helpful 
but credit, the contributor roles taxonomy, takes that one step further, um, but which, because credit is an open standard, um, reflecting the 14 different roles that authors can play um, in a piece of research from conceptualization right through to investigation and uh, you know writing and drafting. But the benefits that credit can bring is really increased transparency and accountability and this has the potential to reduce author disputes and um, really identifies particular expertise and so you can see on this uh, screenshot if you click on an author name and click on the author you can see the credit roles that they played um, and this is really helpful as well, just going back to those early conversations. If you find it difficult to raise these matters with um, colleagues um, doing the research with you or your supervisor, you can say, hey, have you heard about credit? Can we um, try that? Can we take this approach on this piece of research? So you can also see on this uh, uh, screenshot that this particular author has an ORCID ID and you may be familiar with ORCID, um, it's the Open Researcher Contributor ID, which is a free, unique, persistent identifier and distinguishes you from other researchers and you with your research activity, your preprints, your publications, your peer reviews, your grants. Um, and your ORCID profile is really visible to all, so it's a really valuable promotional tool to recognize. But Wiley, we love ORCID and we love credit and hope that you'll um, adopt these standards as well. And if you want further information, you can go to this website here. Thank you.